Good morning, Victory. It is great to be with you. Thank you, Pastor Barry. Not only do we have the UK connection, but a fellow bald preacher, Pastor, appreciate that. I feel, feel very at home uh, here this morning. Uh, by the way, I don't know about you, but my kids love to remind me that I'm bald. I don't know why they do that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Dad, you're, you're bald. Thank you. Thank you for that. I had forgotten. It's actually funny. I, I didn't tell you the story, but when my kids were young, they asked me, Dad, uh, why are you bald? And... Uh, you know, kids ask the great questions, don't they? Why are you bald? And I, and I took on this somber tone. And as I looked at him, and I was like, boys, the dear Lord, he accidentally made me too beautiful. And he told me he's going to need to take something from me. And I was like, this is, this is the burden I must bear. Took my hair, boys. No. It, is, it is so good to be with you. As I was mentioning, my name is Andy, Andy Steiger. Now that I've told that story, you're like, oh, I don't know about this guy. I don't know. And I, I'm here uh, because we just had a conference at Briarcrest, uh, an apologetics conference. It was a great time being here. I love uh, being in Saskatchewan. Every time I've come, it's been beautiful weather. And, uh, and so, um, uh, so people keep inviting me back, first of all, because I keep bringing, I guess, the, be- the beautiful weather. But I've been told these stories of negative 30, and I just can't believe it. Because I've, I've yet to uh, experience it. Every time I've been here, it's just been lovely. And, I, and I've been um, just so blessed to be here. And it is great to be uh, in your church this morning and getting to have the opportunity to bring God's word. Uh, fun uh, connection, small world. But Pastor Dan, his brother is a pastor in British Columbia where I live, uh, just down the road. And, uh, and I know him well, and we've done apologetic stuff at his church. And so it, it, it feels very fitting, I guess, that I'm, I'm here this morning, and I'm thankful uh, for the, the ministry that uh, Pastor Dan's doing in the Philippines. If, uh, if you have your Bible, would you grab it? We're going to jump straight into things today. We're going to go into 2 Timothy. Uh, as you are turning uh, to 2 Timothy uh, apologetics might be a, a new word for you, and you're like, what is this guy that leads a ministry called Apologetics Canada? Apologetics is from the Greek word apologia. It means to give an answer or, or a reason, and specifically we see this in, in 1 Peter chapter 3. He says and, you know, that we should be able, able, willing to give an answer or a reason for the hope that we have in Jesus and to do so with gentleness and respect. It's my prayer this morning that you have hope and that you have good reason for that hope. And that you're willing to share that hope with others and to do so gently and respectfully. We're, we're going to get into that topic today of faith. What it means to have faith. And specifically, I want to look at three things that the Apostle uh, Paul is, is speaking into Timothy's life. This young man that, he's, that he has discipled and he's, he's speaking into his life. In particular, what I want to look at is three aspects of faith that he challenges him with. And that I want to challenge and encourage you with today. So in 2 Timothy, we read, starting in verse 3, Paul says, I thank God whom I've served, whom I serve, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which also... Uh, lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother uh, Eunice. And I'm persuaded now lives in you also. Notice what Paul is saying here to Timothy. Timothy, you have an incredible inheritance of faith. It's not just your faith, Timothy. It is a faith that you have received from your grandmother and from your mother. And that this is something to be celebrated. It's something to be reminded of. Now, this isn't true for all of us, is it? Not all of us have an inheritance of faith. And in fact, I would say that I had the exact exact opposite. I had a uh, faith deficit. I I grew up in a a broken family. I didn't grow up in a Christian family. And maybe some of you can relate with this. It was generational brokenness. My grandmother and my grandfather were alcoholics. My grandma... Uh, left my grandfather. My grandfather died of alcoholism. My mother w- was born into that kind of brokenness and, and she got married and she had four kids and her husband, my dad, left her 
And uh, I was about four years old. I've only seen my father a handful of times in my life. Th- that, that was my inheritance. I grew, I grew up in, in that kind of brokenness. And, and the, the depth of that, as you can imagine, is deep. And I, and, and I, I, I want to just share one aspect of it. When my uh, mom eventually remarried, my biological father called my mom and said, would your new husband... Andy's stepdad, would, would, could he adopt the kids? Could he adopt Andy? I, I don't, I don't want to have any responsibility for them. And so Steiger's not my birth name. Steiger is my uh, adopted name. Now, when you're young, things like that don't necessarily hit right away. You don't feel the full weight of that until oftentimes there's different milestones in your life, different episodes where you begin to realize the weight of your history, of the brokenness. For example, when I uh, fell in love with my now wife and we were dating and I wanted to ask her to marry me and, and, and she said yes and I began to realize that she would take on my last name. A last name that just reminded me of a history of brokenness. Uh, not in, an inheritance of faith, but a deficit. And thinking through, man, do I really want this beautiful woman I love so much? Do I really want her to take this last name? You know, that, that's one of those moments, right, where, where your history kind of hits. Another one is when I'm married now and I have two kids. I have two boys, a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old named William and Tristan. And, and I remember when they were four years old, the age I was when my dad left. And, and you have these moments in your life where you're standing in their shoes, and, you, and you're realizing the weight of the decisions that were made in the, in the history that you've grown up in. And I, I remember being a young man thinking, this isn't what I want. I, I kind of find it interesting when, you know, I'm a, when you're around Christians and you often hear people say, you know, do you think hell exists? I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? Of course it exists. I've I've experienced it. I've seen it. I know brokenness exists. The question that I was asking as a young man is, does heaven exist? Is there anything good in this life? Can anything, and this was the big question, can anything fix this brokenness? Can anything fix this? Let Let me challenge you today, church, with a thought that I think sometimes we take for granted. And that is sometimes when we look at the Bible and we see the miracles that Jesus does, we sometimes get a little too excited about the wrong miracles. You know, it's cool that Jesus can make the, the deaf hear and the lame walk and the blind see, but he could do something so much greater than that. I, I love this episode in Mark chapter 2 where they're learning that, right, Jesus can do miracles. Like, this is amazing. And so they're like, we got to get people to this Jesus, right? And so they have this guy who's lame. He can't walk. And they, and they bring him before Jesus. And they're like, Jesus, do that thing you do, right? Do, do the miracle thing. And Jesus is like, you want to see a miracle? I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you a real miracle. Watch this. Son, your sins are forgiven. Your, your relationship with God has been reconciled. God, this, this is the amazing part, right? Because people are watching this going, okay, we were okay with you being the, the miracle worker, right? That, that tells, you know, the, the blind to see, but, but forgiven sins, that's what God does. Only God can forgive sins, right? And they're looking at this Jesus and they're like, man, we got to get some stones. We got to stone this guy. This guy's blaspheming. He, he's, he's making himself equal with God. Now, of course, Jesus knows what's going on here in their, in their hearts. I'm sure it didn't take much, by the way. I'm sure they looked furious, you know, as, as, as he says his sins are forgiven. And then Jesus says this to them. He says, which is easier? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or say get up and walk? Well, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because I don't know whether or not you could actually do that. It's much harder, you know, uh, to, to, to forgive sins, but, you know, to, to be able to say, get up and walk, well, now I'm going to know immediately whether or not you can actually do it. But Jesus says, listen, so that you might know that I do have the authority and that I can forgive sins and I am who I'm claiming to be, get up and walk. Now, the Jews that are watching this, by the way, it tells us in the passage, you can read it, Mark chapter two, it says, and they were all amazed. What were they amazed at? 
Well, they, they were amazed. Not only could, could the, the lame walk, but this guy just made himself equal with God, telling this, this man that his sins could be forgiven. And instead of God smiting him with a lightning bolt, right? Instead of God knocking him dead, God honors him and says, that's exactly who he is. He is the one that can forgive sins. He is the one that can mend the broken. And, and I remember watching something, a miracle, one of the greatest miracles. Anybody here who's ever seen broken relationships? When you've seen sin at work, you know that, man, it's one thing to believe that God could heal the lame, but to, to believe that God could heal the broken, that he could mend a broken heart, it's hard to believe. But I saw that kind of miracle. I saw that one day when my mom was introduced to Jesus. I saw what happened when God came into her life and as the Holy Spirit filled what was just a shell of a person after the divorce. And I saw, I saw a miracle. As, as a, a life was transformed, healed, the broken made new, and she, the lame, could walk. That's a real miracle. And then, if that wasn't enough, God's like, watch this. And I saw my grandmother come to faith. And I saw her life transformed by the gospel. And I had this moment as a young man where I said, man, God, that's, that's amazing. If you can do that in my mom, if you can do that in my grandma. I remember I had this moment with the Lord where I just said, Lord, could you please do that for me? And I had this prayer, and maybe some of you just need to hear this, because maybe some of you, like me, can resonate with just brokenness and coming from not a, a faith inheritance, but a faith deficit. And I just said, God, could you make my future better than my past? Could you intervene in this, in this history of brokenness? Could you intervene and stop it? And I'm going to give my life to you, and I'm going to follow you, and God, I just ask that you would make my future better in you. And he has answered that prayer, church. He has answered that prayer because I remember as a young man thinking, I've never seen a healthy family. I've never seen a healthy father. I've never seen anything, you know, you know good in that way. How am I going to know how to do that? And I remember, you know, as I came to faith, God going, I'm going to show you. I'm going to, I'm going to walk with you. So, by the way, it's just a fun story, but I, I had this interesting moment as a young kid growing up without a dad. And I, I, I had this idea. I don't know why I had this idea, but I thought, man, it'd, it'd be so cool, you know, of course, one day to be the kind of father I'd never had. And, and then I began to think about what kind of a father would be cool to have. And I don't know why, but I thought, man, it'd be so cool to have a dad that took me on adventures. And I would, it would be so cool to go to Mount Everest with my dad. And would you know, this last May, my wife and I took our boys and we hiked to Mount Everest Base Camp. And we spent five weeks in the Himalayas just having an adventure together. But for me, right, I thought, wow, I did it, right? I went to the Himalayas or whatever. But I had this moment with my boys where I asked them, I said, boys, what was your best, what was your favorite moment being out here in the mountains? And they looked at me and this, this just broke my heart. They said, dad, getting to just be with you for five weeks has been awesome. And I, I get teary out every time I think of it. Relationship. That's what matters. Not some mountain. Relationship. Just being with you. Good, healthy relationship where you love God and you love people. And this is the way, church, that it was always meant to be. It's the way it was meant to be. And through Christ, we can find that. And we can live in that. And by God's power, I want to continue to entrust myself to him. And my wife and I, I, we said, listen, let us work together as Christ works in us that we, and, and I should note this, my wife and I, we, we kept the last name Steiger because we said, listen, we through Christ can redeem this. We can redeem this and through Christ in us, we can give off to our children a faith inheritance that I never had. And we're, we'll, we're still doing that. And by the way, the Lord has a great sense of humor. I love climbing, and that's probably why I took my kids to, to the Himalayas. And uh, not long after we did, made that decision, I met a German, and he, he loved saying my name, Steiger. 
And he, he said, do you know what your, you, he said, your name's German. Do you know that? And I said, no, I didn't know that. And he goes, do you know what your name means? And I go, no. And he says, in German, it means climber. It means one who likes to, to hike. And I thought, man, God, got a good sense of humor. <laughs> All right, so come back to me in uh, 2 Timothy. Uh, again, chapter 1. Now I want to look at verses 6 to 7. So Paul's just challenged Timothy, reminding him, you have a faith inheritance. You have a faith. And for some of us, it's been a rocky road to faith. And maybe some of you, you don't even know yet if you have faith. And it's something I want to challenge you to think about today as we continue on. And now he, he, he challenges Timothy saying, but is your faith growing? What are you doing with the faith? What are you doing with the inheritance that you've received, Timothy? And, uh, and he says this in uh, verses six to seven. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of, of my hands, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. This is the kind of faith that you and I are to have. Now, I think this idea of fanning into flame might be kind of lost on us these days because we don't necessarily cook with fires. But back in the first century, that's how you cooked. And it's hard to start a fire from scratch, so you don't do that, right? They didn't have lighters and, and matches. You always kept an ember. And then when you're ready to use that ember, you took it out and you blew on it. You fanned it and, it and it lit into a fire, right? And we know that the more you put on that fire, the bigger it's going to get. And Paul's saying, this is what your faith should be like. Don't let it just be some sort of ember that you just leave there. Never use but take it out, blow on it, fan it, feed it, and grow that, 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 that ember into a fire. I want to, I want to encourage you. What, do you. what are you doing with your faith? Are you growing your faith? You know, one of the, there's lots of things I could talk about with regards to this, but I'll just hit one point. One of the best ways, church, that you can grow your faith is by being real with yourself. Being real with, with where you're at with the Lord. And, and being re- real with the questions that you have and the doubts that you have. Don't avoid those. Don't push those down. But you need to deal with those. That's a good and normal thing to do as a Christian. In fact, this is, this is what faith is. Sometimes, sometimes we get this poor understanding of faith and we buy into this idea that faith or Christianity is some sort of blind thing where I'm just... I'm just some sort of naive, hopeful person, you know, pie in the sky sort of idea. The Bible is nothing about that sort of idea of blind faith. A biblical understanding of faith is trusting what you have good reason to believe is true. Trusting what you have good reason to believe is true. And I, and I, I came across recently an analogy of this that I find helpful. I was doing a, a film project with Apologetics Canada, and we were... Um, on a, a sailboat, it was very, uh, it, it was fun. So, doing apologetics, sometimes we get to do fun things. So we're, we're on a sailboat out in British Columbia. We're filming and we're talking about faith. We're telling uh, actually um, a sailor's uh, faith journey. And while we were in harbor one night, we were out there for four days, we laid anchor. And I've never, I've never been on a boat before. I've never laid anchor. And I just kind of had this idea, naively, that when you're done, and you, you know, for the night, right, you just throw an anchor overboard and you're like, you're good, right? And you just head off to bed. But those of you who've been on a ship, that's not what happens. When you throw the anchor over, you begin to pull on that anchor. You twist and turn, reverse the engines. You do everything you can to try to dislodge it. And I remember I, I, I came up to the captain at one point. I'm like, what on earth are you doing? And I think you've been at this for a while. And he's like, well, I'm laying anchor. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but why do you keep tugging on that thing? And he goes, because I want to sleep at night. I'm like, well, what do you mean? And he goes, listen, if this thing pulls out in the middle of the night, we're going to be adrift in the open ocean. If this thing pulls in the middle of the night, we're going to be brought to the rocks and, and we're going to be dashed on, on these rocks in the middle of nowhere. We're going to sink. He says, our life depends on this anchor holding. It's interesting. The book of Hebrews chapter six is exactly what it says. It says that Jesus is the anchor for our, our souls, firm and secure. It will hold. And in fact, the book of Hebrews is telling you that anchor, you can pull on it. It will hold. It is firm and secure and you can sleep at night. You can, your soul can rest in Jesus knowing that it will hold. 
Now listen, I gotta tell you, when I became a Christian, I was afraid to deal with my questions. I was afraid to deal with any doubts. You know why? Because I loved Jesus so much. I, I loved him so much and I loved what God was doing in my life. I was almost afraid to ask any questions that I was struggling with because I was, af- I, I was afraid of what I was gonna find. I'm like, you know, maybe, maybe this is just wishful thinking. Remember, I went to Bible college. I was, God was calling me into ministry. I went off to Bible college and, and, and for the first time in my life, I grabbed hold of that anchor and I started to pull on it. In Bible college, I remember thinking, man, what's gonna happen when I pull on this thing? Is it gonna just pull right up? And it didn't. It's just like Hebrew said, it was firm and it was secure and I was so encouraged. But then as God continued to call me into ministry further and as I pastored more, God's like, okay, it's time to, I want you to do some more education and I find myself doing a master's degree. And again, I get a little, I get nervous again. What's gonna happen, right? I'm gonna start asking more questions. I'm gonna start pulling a little harder. And guess what, church? It was firm and secure, and as God led me now from pastoral ministry into apologetics ministry, okay, I'm, God's like, why don't you do a PhD? I'm like, okay, and I'm, you know, I'm off. Now I'm pulling on the anchor as hard as I can, and it is firm and secure. Let me tell you, church, I love Jesus so much, and maybe you don't hear this enough, but I love being a Christian because I've pulled on that anchor. I know that it is the one that is firm and secure, It is where you will find rest for your soul, just as Jesus said. And I want to encourage you. Apologetics Canada is a ministry that exists to come alongside churches, as we do across Canada, and just say, hey, let's grow in our faith together. Let's take that ember out, and let's fan that into flame, because I believe that when our faith is ignited through the Holy Spirit, that we will see lives transformed by the gospel, that we will see our own lives transformed by the gospel as we are confident in the assurance that we have in him. Amen? Amen. So please, don't run from your faith. Engage, fan, and watch as God works in, in your life and as your faith is strengthened through him. He is the anchor that will hold. Now, I want to look at the third thing that uh, Paul brings up to Timothy, okay? So the first one is, um, what it, you, know, you have faith, you have a faith inheritance. What are you doing with that faith? Are you growing that faith? And now thirdly, he asks uh, Timothy a hard question, a hard question about faith. We're in verse eight to nine. He asks him, are you ashamed of that faith? Verse eight, so do not be ashamed of the testimony about your Lord or of me, his prisoner, rather join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Now, for honest, this is a tough one for us to, to wrestle with. Okay, I have faith, I want my faith to be growing, but am I ashamed of that faith? Notice what um, Paul says here as he speaks about Jesus Christ. I just want to highlight this for a moment because I think sometimes as Christians we forget what it means to be a Christian. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is a title. Now, the word Christ is Greek for the Hebrew word Messiah, And the Hebrew word Messiah uh, means anointed one. It means anointed because the Jews didn't crown their kings. They anointed them with oil. They smeared them. And so when you say Jesus Christ, you're quite literally saying King Jesus. But this this raises a question that you got to think about, especially in our world of extreme individualism. Is it King me? Or is it King Jesus? Is my identity rooted in me or is my identity rooted in him? And am I proud to be a follower of King Jesus? Or as Paul's challenging Timothy, am I ashamed? This is something that can be very difficult to come to grips with with your own self. Like, where am I at with the Lord on this? I, um, 
in the first service, I shared a story uh, that I want to tell you. But my colleague uh, that works with me in Alberta, he was here. His name's Steve Kim. And, and he was there for this story. So Barry can confirm this really did, this really did happen. I always love that when somebody else is in the room when you tell a story because you're like, I'm telling you, this, this really took place. Uh, I was teaching a class on apologetics, and I had it in mind that, that uh, I got this great idea in my mind that the final exam should be part written and part oral. And the oral part of the exam is I told them that I was going to bring in my, agna- my agnostic Buddhist friend, and that for the final exam, they needed to share the gospel with him. And then I said, and if he comes to faith, you're getting extra credit. You're getting extra credit. <laughs> And, and so Steve, he's Korean, so I figured they'll just believe he's Buddhist. Uh, and, and of course, they're not coming into my agnostic Buddhist friend. It's, my, it's you know, my colleague, Steve, the Christian, but they don't know that. All they know is they go into this room and he's sitting there like this meditating, you know. <laughs> and these students are losing their mind. I had two girls in particular, they are ugly crying. They are so scared to, to take this exam. And they, they asked me, they go, can I please not taste, take this exam? And I look at her, I'm like, no, you're, you're doing it, you know. And, and they all took this, you know, exam where they write this thing and then they go into the room one by one by themselves with Steve. They share the gospel with Steve and they talk with him. And then at the end, of course, Steve tells him, hey, listen, I'm actually a Christian. And, and here's some pointers as you're, as you're telling, you know, as you're introducing people to Jesus. And after this class, I thought I was going to get in trouble because the, the next week, uh, these students come to me and I, I was ready just to start teaching again. And they're like, no, 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 time out. Uh, you've got to debrief what just happened last week because that ruined me. That wrecked me. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And this one girl in particular had cried at the beginning that I told her she had to do this. She's like, that broke me. And I go, well, what do you mean? And she goes, Andy, I went home after that exam and I cried for two hours in my apartment. And I'm like, was Steve that hard on you? <laughs> and she's like, no. I came, to, I came to realize that I'm ashamed of the gospel, Andy. She said, why on earth was I so afraid to tell this guy about Jesus, to introduce him to Jesus? And he was a Christian anyways. <laughs> she goes, I had to come to terms with what's going on in here. Why, why was I unwilling to, to just introduce him to Jesus? You know what's interesting? God did a work in her, and her name's Sam. Sam and her husband became missionaries. They served the Lord all over the place. And now she, she is not ashamed to share the gospel. She is not ashamed to introduce people to Jesus, but she had to have a moment with herself in the Lord. Maybe you do. I know that I did. Uh, mine, uh, what maybe is a little even more shameful because I was a young pastor. I just started in ministry. And I was officiating a a wedding uh, with a a doctor and his wife, who was a nurse. And and the reason I bring that up is because during the reception, which is on this beautiful boat, I was surrounded by all of, you know, these accomplished people, right? So I'm sitting at this table, and they're going around one by one telling about, you know, I'm the surgeon of this, right? I'm the anesthesiologist of this. I'm the head of this department, blah, blah, blah. And then he gets to my turn, the pastor right? And, and they're like, what do you do? And I, and I had this moment where, and my wife was there, by the way, of course, the Lord had to have somebody watch this take place. Uh, and I said to them, well, I'm a pastor, but I'm, I'm thinking about becoming a lawyer, I said to them. And I'll never forget, my wife whipped her head over at me, and we made eye contact. Those of you married, you know what I'm talking about, this sort of eye contact, where, where my, life, my wife is like, what on earth? You know, it was one of those like, like you know, slappy moment with, with her eyes. And, and I needed that, by the way. I needed that because, and, and the Lord just had to meet with me at a moment there at this table going, are you ashamed? Are you ashamed to be a pastor? Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you ashamed of me? What's going on here, Andy? And man, me and the Lord had to have a moment there. And that, that, was, that was a key moment in my walk with the Lord of going, okay, yeah, what, what is going on in my life? And maybe this is something that you need to think about. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Because if I could encourage you, I don't want to end on some sort of discouraging, <laughs> don't be ashamed of the gospel. I want to encourage you in the power of the gospel. Could I just say that I am so thankful, I don't know this lady's name, but I, 
I am so thankful for a lady that was not ashamed of the gospel and that was willing to introduce my mom to Jesus. That introduced my mom to Jesus. How, how would I have known of the power of Jesus that he could heal like in Mark chapter two, how am I gonna know that unless you bring somebody before him, right? I, I, I think to myself like, who is the broken in my life that just needs to be brought to the feet of Jesus and going, hey, this is the one who can mend you. This is the one that does those, those miracles that can, that can mend the broken. That happened in my mom as that happened in my grandmother. You know, I had a, an interesting moment just recently, a young lady who was just at the end of herself, reached out to me recently. She said, listen, Andy, I've lived my life without God. I've gone headlong into secularism and just done whatever I wanted to do. I did me. I was king me. And she said, and it left me at the end of myself, and I was ready to just end, end it all. I was ready just to take my life. But then she thought, maybe, maybe, I need to think about, maybe I need to think about God. She asked me if I'd go to coffee with her, and she said this. She said, Andy, we're having coffee, and she said, Andy, would you just introduce me to Jesus? And, and I, it was such a privilege to just say, yes, let me introduce you to King Jesus that can mend the broken. And to see her now on this journey. Listen, church, there are people in your life that need to be introduced to Jesus. It's true of me, it's true of you, and I just pray that each of us, as we are coming to terms with the faith that we have, either inheritance or, or deficit but that we're growing that faith. And that that faith as it grows is not a faith that we're ashamed of, but is one that we share with the world that desperately needs Jesus. We live in a broken world that, de de that desperately needs him, amen? amen? And so let us be those kind of people. And I also just wanna, as we, as we close in prayer here, I just wanna give you a, a challenge. Maybe you're at the very beginning of that journey and maybe today is an opportunity for you to say, man, God, I wanna place my trust in you. I want to follow after you, and I want, to, I want to begin to build a faith inheritance starting with me. That can start now. And that maybe this morning, though, is a morning you need to come to terms with, hey, man, where, where am I with the Lord? And there's some of you that have started that faith journey, but you haven't taken that step of baptism. That step of saying, you know what? I am identifying with King Jesus. He is my king. And I'm identifying in his baptism, death, his, his life, death, and resurrection that is now true in me, that I have life in him, my firm foundation, and I'm going to live for him. Maybe today is the day that you meet with the Lord, and it's time to take that step of faith. Let me pray for you. Lord God, as we come before you now. God, I just pray your spirit would be at work in each one of us. God, that you would be challenging us, encouraging us, inspiring us, and leading us forward as we take the faith that we have, as we grow that faith in you, as we are real with ourselves and our doubts and our questions, and as we answer those and we see and as we pull on that anchor and know that you are the firm foundation. A firm foundation that I am happy to tell other people about because I know that you can heal the broken that you can heal the sin in my life, the sin in other people's lives, that you can mend broken relationships, our broken relationship with you and our broken relationship with one another. God, I pray that we would be bold in sharing that as we introduce people to you and that we would take that step of obedience and baptism as we identify that you are my king. Amen.